Gentlemen, I am Colonel Hall, Director of Warning and Threat Assessments, Office of the Assistant Chief of Staff, Intelligence. In this air intelligence presentation, we have traced the development of the Soviet ballistic missile threat to the United States from its inception just after the close of World War II through the period ending 1 January 1960. We do not believe that the Soviet rulers imagined they can achieve decisive military superiority over the United States through the exploitation of a single weapon system such as the ICBM. However, we do believe they hope to exploit its capabilities as an integral part of a mixed offensive force, which together with other offensive and defensive systems will enable them to achieve decisive military superiority over the United States at the earliest practicable date. It is with this thought in mind that we have analyzed the development of the ICBM and the nature and dimensions of the threat it poses during the period 1960 to 1970. Your briefing officer is Lieutenant Colonel Joel Parks of my staff. Gentlemen, this air intelligence briefing is secret. This presentation will highlight some significant aspects of the development of the Soviet ICBM threat to the United States. To arrive at the firmest possible estimate of Soviet ICBM capabilities, we've analyzed the Soviet guided missile test program in great depth. Specifically, we've analyzed development of missile test ranges and associated research activities at Kapustin Yar, where missiles up to 1,100 nautical miles are fired, and Tayur Tan, where ICBMs and space vehicles are launched. By 1 January 1960, some 21 ICBMs had been fired from Tayur Tan, impacting on the Kamchatka Peninsula and on some occasions the Pacific Ocean. But these do not represent all Soviet ICBM research and development testing, since their test program has been conducted continuously and energetically since 1947 at Kapustin Yar. The Ballistic Missile Division of ARDC has helped investigate those firings believed to have been related to ICBM development. The Kapustin Yar test range extends easterly from the Stalingrad area toward Lake Balkash. The range head is some 15 to 25 nautical miles east of the village of Kapustin Yar. Impact zones are at various distances, the furthest being about 1,100 nautical miles. Each zone is heavily instrumented with optical and electronic gear. Prior to the 1955 installation of the FPS-17 long-range radar at Diabrica, Turkey, and new Eland intercept gear to record telemetry, we relied on sources of a lower technical reliability to provide information about the Soviet guided missile program. During 1958, coverage of the long-range radar was extended from 1,000 to 2,000 nautical miles, with several beams added to increase intercept possibilities. Generally, all firings at Kapustin Yar beyond the 600 nautical mile range can be picked up by our long-range radar. Another radar operational since February 1959 has been constructed on Shimia Island in the Aleutians to detect Soviet ICBM firings. All Soviet ICBM and space shots since then have been detected, except one probable ICBM firing on 9 June 1959, when equipment was inoperative due to maintenance. Total firings at Kapustin Yar until 1 January 1960 are estimated at several hundred. This indicates a continuously progressive R&D program has been energetically carried on by the Soviets for 10 years or more. Evidence indicates that this has provided the Soviets with operational weapons of 200 nautical miles and less, 350, 700, and 1,100 nautical miles. Kapustin Yar has always been the workhorse range for, for Soviet ballistic missile development. Therefore, it must have been used for component testing and development for the ICBM before activation of the ICBM space missile test range at Tayuratan. Geographic limitations of the Kapustin Yar range limit firings to about 1,200 nautical miles. These facts indicate that the Soviets would be forced to activate an ICBM test range, but its actual existence was not known until early 1957, when the range hit in the Tayuratan area was discovered and the impact zone was generally located in the area of the Kamchatka Peninsula. 
Good Eland coverage of the Tayuratam Range Terminal was not effective until late 1957. But we believe the two ICBM firings in or before September 1957, announced by Khrushchev, were probably launched from Tayuratam so as to travel the full 3,500 nautical miles to the Kamchatka area. Judging from Soviet announcements, collateral reports, and computation of satellite orbits, Soviet Sputniks 1, 2, and 3 were launched from Tayuratam. Similar computations indicate that Luni 1, 2, and 3 were also launched from Tayuratam. It is generally agreed that military missile components were used to launch all space vehicles. We have had good telemetry intercept on every Soviet ICBM and space firing since 30 January 1958, including the launch and re-entry phases of the ICBMs and the launching phase of space vehicles. The recordings indicate that similarly configured boosters are used for all of these firings. Four apparently successful 3,500 nautical mile ICBM firings were made at Tayura Tam in the relatively short time of January to May 1958. Initial component testing must have taken place at Kapustin Yar and other test facilities. Like our own test program, the Soviets must also test various components at lesser ranges before moving into the true ICBM test phase of 3,500 miles or more. Reentry data and stage separation are tested at both the shorter and the longer ranges. Telemetry intercept on ICBM firings shows considerable development in guidance and reentry body instrumentation as early as March 1958 and indicates the development program was in a late state even at that time. Therefore, it must have been preceded by a long and intensive test program with numerous flight tests of components. The intelligence community, together with the Ballistic Missile Division of ARDC, re-examined the cumulative data on the Kapustin Yar tests to find out how much of this initial ICBM testing was done with shorter range test vehicles during the past two or three years. The conclusions were that since mid-1956, the Soviets probably fired over 40 missiles to 700 nautical miles to test ICBM components. Many of the firings of the 1100 nautical mile missiles since mid-1957 probably had very close ICBM associations. The time correlation between firings of the 1100 nautical mile missile and the ICBM firings definitely pointed to a close relationship between the two. This, coupled with technical analysis and photography of the Sputniks, has led the Assistant Chief of Staff Intelligence, Air Force, to believe that the Soviets may have had a twin ICBM program, initially with a 700 nautical mile type of missile, and later with the 1100 nautical mile version. The latter missile is believed to have formed the main booster stages for Sputnik 3 and the Lunix. During 1957, 58, and 59, some nine vertical firings have been detected by Radiant and Eland. These were undoubtedly for upper air and pathological research. On at least two firings, nose cone separation tests were positively identified. Telemetry readout has confirmed Soviet statements that live animals have been ejected during some of these firings. These tests paved the way for the ESV program and included testing of equipment to permit recovery of components from high altitudes. This evidence of considerable R&D on their ICBM ESV program at Kapustin Yar substantiates belief that Soviet ICBM development has been energetically pursued for years and has now reached a highly advanced stage. The Soviet missile development program reveals that it introduces a new dimension to surprise and forces us to reassess our own strategic position and re-evaluate the Soviet's ability to deal a crippling blow. Most vital in this regard are their intercontinental and submarine launched missiles, since they can be brought to bear directly against the continental United States. Rapid development of ballistic missile and nuclear technology places at the disposal of the Soviet hierarchy a new order of destructive capability. The ICBM nuclear warhead system is beyond anything in our previous experience, because the speed with which the enemy can damage us is increasing, and chances of detecting his impending moves are decreasing. The attacker who can launch a large-scale surprise attack in a very short time now has a tremendous advantage which could well result 
in immediate destruction or paralysis of the victim's capacity to resist and prevent him from making a devastating counterattack. It could contribute heavily to the achievement of decisive military superiority. As stated previously, there is no doubt that the Soviets had fired at least 21 ICBM test vehicles by 1 January 1960. And from the Sputniks and Luniks, we know they have solved the problems of propulsion and guidance necessary for an effective ICBM weapon system. How well they have solved the re-entry problem is not known, but they have made notable advances in geodesy, cartography, and gravimetry, important requirements in firing missiles. We estimate they can now pinpoint the geographic position of targets in the United States to within one quarter of a mile or less. Concerning probable Soviet ICBM weapon characteristics, available intelligence does not permit a precise estimate. However, knowledge of the Soviet development program, coupled with U.S. research and development in the ballistic missile field, leads to the conclusion that the first generation Soviet ICBMs probably have these characteristics. Partial or parallel configuration based primarily on telemetry analysis. A speed of Mach 25 necessary for a 5,500 mile ballistic trajectory and in fact observed by radiant intercepts. Guidance of the initial operational ICBMs is likely to be by radar track radio command inertial with all inertial guidance possible in the near future and an initial operational capability CEP of three nautical miles improving to two nautical miles by 1963. Payload available for the warhead would probably yield about eight megatons. Improvements of Soviet ICBMs should incorporate appreciable differences in reliability, payload, and accuracy, and almost certainly incorporate a heavy decoy capability. Order of accuracy attributed to the first Soviet ICBMs makes its military effectiveness contingent upon development of a nuclear warhead of high yield and relatively low weight. Early achievement of a warhead weight yield relationship compatible with the expected missile accuracy is now indicated. Regarding nuclear material, we know that the Soviets have an extensive research and production program. At the present estimated rate of expansion, we believe that by mid-1961, the Soviets are likely to have enough nuclear warheads to meet the requirements of their available weapon systems. It is probable that first-generation Soviet ICBMs will be launched from comparatively simple fixed bases. We believe, however, that the ICBM will have some mobility and will be rail-supported. Fixed installations may include, as a minimum, relatively simple launch pads, checkout and control facilities, and possibly guidance equipment. The Soviets are considered to have the capability to harden their operational ICBM bases. It is estimated, however, that initially all Soviet ICBM bases will be soft. In the period 1962 and after, it is possible that some of the bases will be hardened to withstand overpressures as great as 100 PSI. We estimate all Soviet ICBM bases will be inside the USSR. Bases will probably be on or near rail lines. It is likely that they will be located near air bases and major industrial or military installations. Other factors probably influencing the location of missile bases include security, proximity to industrial support, climate, physiography, and booster impact requirements. Distance to target is a primary consideration but not a limiting factor due to the probable range of the Soviet ICBM. In general, it appears that the URLs, the area along the Trans-Siberian Railroad, and the region served by the kotlas vorkuta rail line in northwestern USSR are especially well suited for ICBM deployment. However, ICBM launch sites certainly can be located elsewhere in the Soviet Union. The emerging nature of the ICBM threat to the United States is best defined by an overall estimate of Soviet capabilities during the next 10 years. During this period, it is expected that the Soviet aerospace threat will consist of a mixed force of ICBMs and long-range bombers, some armed with air-to-surface missiles. In any such attack, we believe the highest priority would be against SAC bases and any ICBM launching facilities we might have in operation in order to blunt our retaliatory strike capability. This would be followed, if possible, by attacks against our major industrial and political centers. The operational inventory of ICBMs is estimated to be 50 in mid-1960. 
and 250 in mid-1961. Of these, it is expected that about 22 could reach U.S. target areas in an initial strike in 1960, and about 125 in 1961. The CEPs are estimated to be three nautical miles, and the warhead yield could be as high as eight to 10 megatons. Of the total strategic bomber tanker force of 1,250 aircraft, it is expected that excluding those kills from enemy action, some 500 to 600 bombers should be able to reach U.S. territory. This force would consist mostly of jet medium bombers flying refueled one-way missions. The weapons carried could be nuclear bombs yielding 8 to 12 megatons in 1960 and 10 to 20 megatons in 1961, provided testing is resumed. Bombers could carry air-to-surface missiles having 55 nautical mile range in 1960 and from 55 to 350 nautical miles in 1961. By the 1962-1963 period, the total operational ICBM inventory could be as high as 500 in 1962 and 800 in 1963. Of these, 288 could reach target areas in 1962 and 490 in 1963. The CEPs are expected to improve to at least two nautical miles by 1963. The warhead yields could be 10 megatons or higher by 1963, provided testing is resumed. By the 19... ...period, the total strategic bomber force is expected to be stabilized at about 1,000 aircraft and have a larger percentage of jet-heavy bombers and tankers and a few supersonic dash bombers. Of this estimated inventory, we expect 400 to 500 aircraft to be able to reach United States territory. Not counting losses due to enemy action, this force should be able to recover about a third of its strike bombers for subsequent missions. The weapons carried would be bombs yielding up to 20 megatons if the Soviets resumed testing and air-to-surface missiles with ranges of at least 350 nautical miles. The heavy bombers should be able to carry two such missiles. It is also expected that by 1963, the Soviets could have operational about six nuclear-powered guided missile submarines, capable of launching about 70 ballistic missiles with ranges of 500 to 1,000 nautical miles, with CEPs of two to four nautical miles. It is much more difficult to define the nature and composition of the Soviet aerospace threat for the 1964 to 1970 period. However, certain developments are expected. The number of strategic bombers is expected to remain at about 1,000. We expect the Bayer turboprop bomber to be gradually replaced by a nuclear bomber, beginning in the 1964 period, and a supersonic bomber is expected to replace a large part of the Badger force in the latter half of this period. The air-to-surface missile is expected to improve in accuracy and range, and although there is no evidence of the development of an ASM with ranges in excess of 500 nautical miles, such weapons are estimated to be within Soviet technical capabilities. Flexibility provided by the nuclear bomber and the increased speeds and altitudes of the supersonic bomber, as well as higher yield weapons, should give the Soviets a greatly improved manned air weapons capability. Although there must be some fairly wide parameters in any estimate of Soviet operational ICBM inventories beyond 1963, they have the industrial capability to build an inventory of at least 2,000 ICBMs by the late 1960s. The United States Air Force has consistently maintained that the Soviets are trying to achieve decisive military superiority. The major weapon systems which would affect this capability appear to be nuclear-propelled and supersonic bombers and reliable and accurate ICBMs. Thus, the Air Force believes the Soviets will continually maintain a large mixed force of ICBMs and bombers for the foreseeable future and further improve speeds, CEPs, and reliabilities. Gentlemen, this concludes the Air Intelligence presentation of the development of the Soviet ballistic missile threat to the United States. May I remind you again that the classification of this briefing is secret. On the 20th, and the 31st of January, 1960, the Soviets successfully launched 
two additional ICBM test vehicles to extended range into the Pacific. A total of 23 successful firings to date. The Soviets claim these firings were part of their space development program using more powerful multi-stage ballistic rockets. This may be true. However, the evidence of an instrumented nose cone re-entry and previously estimated capability of the Soviets with their known hardware leads us to the view that these firings should be looked upon as ICBM shots for determination of accuracy and re-entry characteristics at extended ranges. In any case, the demonstrated and announced accuracy of these firings indicates the existence now of a formidable ICBM weapon system. Intercontinental ballistic missile is now a grim reality. It cuts warning time from hours to minutes. Therefore, the Strategic Air Command must keep a force in the air around the clock to ensure decisive retaliation, even if its bases are blasted away. This is a documentary of Operation Head Start, a three-month test demonstration conducted at Loring Air Force Base, Maine, by the 45th Air Division of the 8th Air Force. It portrays the crews and support personnel who demonstrated conclusively that an airborne alert can be maintained successfully. From a pool of 24 B-52 bombers and 12 KC-135 tankers, Head Start dispatches planes on airline-type schedules with a combat-ready bomber taking off every six hours and flying a set route of about 20 hours duration. SAC must know where these bombers are at all times. Single sideband position reports refer to charted points along the route, which avoid the use of map coordinates. SAC also sends frequent Foxtrot test messages, any one of which might be no test, but an order sending the bomber to war. Command communication is thus virtually continuous. At a fixed rendezvous point, a tanker refuels each bomber. Here is the full operation. Each green bomber has fuel and an able crew for a war mission. When it turns yellow, it has become ineffective until relaunched. Head Start Operations has its finger on the pulse of all planes and crews available for the exercise. It marries a crew with an aircraft and schedules them into the pipeline of airborne alert bombers and tankers. Once the crews are scheduled for head start, they're given their initial briefing. Here they'll find out what their mission will entail. Particular emphasis is placed on the importance of communication. There is a general intelligence briefing, including the latest world news. A briefing on all safety regulations and amendments. And of course, they'll learn handling procedures from the special weapons officer. The crew, anticipating 20 hours in the air, thoroughly pre-flights its aircraft at least 15 hours before takeoff. There'll be no time for last minute adjustments. The planes must roll on schedule. Maintenance, which is the backbone of any large airborne operation, improved its efficiency and scheduling to meet the demands of the operation. Despite severe weather conditions, the crews worked around the clock on the flight line 
and inside the hangars to provide support to the endless chain of bombers and tankers. Close coordination with supply personnel was necessary to be sure that aircraft parts were available to the maintenance specialists. Stock levels of supplies were revised and adjusted to meet this stepped up flying schedule. After electronic specialists have checked the turret system, the guns are loaded with combat ammunition. The bomb load is carefully cradled into the bomb bay. These devastating bombs are carried fully armed, but it takes concerted action by more than one crewman to operate the release mechanism. The arming system is checked out thoroughly prior to loading the bombs. After 12 hours of uninterrupted sleep and relaxation, the crew members leave their quarters and begin the last three hours prior to takeoff. A bus picks up the crew and takes them to the dining hall, where they are served a specially planned high protein meal important to strength and stamina during their long mission to come. During this time, the weather officer is preparing data to give to the crew at the pre-takeoff weather briefing. Two hours before takeoff, the crew reports for the pre-takeoff briefing. The briefing officer reviews the final details of the flight plan from takeoff roll to touchdown. After the flight plan, the latest weather is given along with alternate bases to be used in case of below minimum weather or emergencies. Finally, the medical officer gives instructions coping with fatigue, dehydration, and the other physical problems crew members will have to face. The final briefing is over. While the rest of the crew files the flight plan, two crewmen go to the in-flight kitchen to pick up the meals that will sustain them a lot. These are not ordinary in-flight lunches. They were tailored for Head Start requirements by a dietary specialist. No one is allowed to bring food from home. One hour before takeoff, the crew arrives at the aircraft for last minute inspections and engine warm up. The division commander maintains close contact with the operation and makes frequent visits to the flight line. After a final review of individual emergency procedures, the crew now boards the aircraft to begin 20 hours of flying on another Head Start mission. The wheels are rolling on schedule. Under the watchful eye of personnel in the tower, the bomber taxis to the warm-up pad to await final clearance. With final clearance from the tower, the B-52 begins its takeoff roll. Takeoff, all parts functioning properly. Support personnel have done a good job. Now the crew settles down to routine flying. As soon as the plane is airborne, the command post places it on the head start track. And inside the B-52, the navigator asks the ECM operator for a heading check. Pinpoint navigation is essential. A slight mistake could trigger the Air Defense Command's network and bring interceptors up to investigate an unidentified aircraft. Further, a navigational error could possibly complicate the refueling rendezvous. As the hours pass, it becomes necessary for crewmen to supplement body liquids lost through dehydration under the pressurized conditions. Hourly position reports are relayed, and the plane's location is charted. With the aircraft's position noted, the report is authenticated, and the aircraft commander logs the time of acknowledgement. Hours aboard the bomber under pressure of the mission develop hearty appetites. 
time to prepare the in flight meals in a specially designed electric oven these high protein meals help to combat fatigue the length of the mission makes it mandatory that the bomber make a regular rendezvous with the refueling aircraft the refueling point is a fixed position constant in all sorties long before the KC-135 appears on the scene radar contact is made soon the pilot is in visual contact with the tanker Head Start experience has reduced heavyweight refueling from the complex to the routine. Most of the boom operators involved in Operation Head Start earned admission to the Million Pound Club. Prerequisite for membership, a million or more pounds of fuel transferred in ten sorties or less. And the bomber crews have a one gulp club for those who have taken on at least 100,000 pounds of fuel without a disconnect. When its tanks are replenished, the B-52 will continue on its extended mission, again ready for the signal which could send it to its pre-designated target. SAC headquarters frequently transmits Foxtrot no answer required messages. Any one of the messages could commit the crew to combat. Because these crews generally include a relief man, members occasionally catch a few minutes of needed rest. With the airborne mission completed, RAPCON takes over and gives radar landing assistance. And the bomber goes into the pattern. The tower alerts emergency vehicles, a standard procedure for all Head Start landings. On the ground at last, 20 hours after takeoff, but the mission is not complete until after debriefing. The debriefing allows maintenance and intelligence specialists an opportunity to interrogate the crew on aircraft performance, radar returns, aerial refueling, and any other matters which may pertain to the mission. Although the crew is tired, it realizes that the information reported here is important to the success of the exercise. The flight surgeon is an important member of the skilled debriefing team. He is constantly on the alert, checking the crew's physical condition. As soon as engines are cut, maintenance crews go to work to ready the aircraft for its next sortie. After about six sorties, Obama receives a major inspection, during which time another plane takes its place in the head start pool. Maintenance operations are planned for in advance. Schedules are coordinated to assure a steady flow of ready aircraft. Maintenance Control Center monitors all progress. Each unit on the base works to keep the planes in the air. All have contributed from administrative and maintenance men to snow removal teams. and flight line security is maintained constantly to protect our planes and our plans. A special SAC data control unit immediately processes the reports from each sortie to keep the records up to the minute and allow the fastest possible analysis and charting of the data. After their debriefing, many of the crew go to the physical conditioning room for a steam bath and rub down to help them unwind from the tensions of hours in the air. At last for this crew, the long flight is over. And as they head for home, another crew and plane are on the runway, ready to go. This is the story of Operation Head Start, which may become one of the building blocks in SAC's alert posture. Multiply this cycle by 10 or by 100 and you can see in depth the concept of airborne alert.
There is only world peace where there is power to preserve order among nations. And the retaliatory power of the Strategic Air Command of the United States Air Force is the greatest deterrent to general war there is in the world today. Its nuclear-armed bombers and missiles stand ready to counterattack any aggressor unwise enough to start a general war among the nations of our world. Many SAC bombers carry missiles to increase their strike range. Some carry decoys to multiply the number of targets an enemy's radar would see. There are jet tankers which can refuel bombers outbound for the other side of the world and again on our side to get them home. Nuclear-tipped missiles buried underground will survive all but a direct nuclear hit. Half of the combat-ready bombers and tankers are poised for takeoff within minutes. In addition, some are always airborne along special routes, ready for orders that would send them to their target. This force is supported by more than a quarter million men working at more than 75 bases throughout the world. So that we can use this mighty force most effectively, our president, wherever he is, has immediate communication with the SAC Commander-in-Chief through the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the radio and telephone networks of the National Military Command System. General, this is Senior Controller. You're wanted on Mobile. The SAC commander has the same immediate contact with all his forces through the SAC communication system. We shall see how this network can swing SAC's armada into action within seconds and control it. But first, let's see how it is used routinely to maintain SAC's high combat-ready levels and alert status. Deep beneath SAC headquarters is a three-story structure. Its entrances are guarded by specially selected and specially trained air policemen. The building's roof and walls are thick concrete. The steel doors can shut out above ground environment and seal in a pressurized atmosphere. Decontamination locks allow safe entrance and exit in case of hot radiation outside, while special air conditioners supply fresh air and filter out nuclear contamination. These huge diesel-powered generators can meet the underground electricity needs if commercial sources fail. There's enough food to support personnel for an extended period. Fresh water comes from deep wells. Except in actual or simulated emergencies, the doors are open, and this is merely an office building, housing key operational elements of Strategic Air Command headquarters. On the top and middle floors of the underground is Weather Central, where specialists assemble meteorological facts and record them on global weather maps around the clock. In the Teletype Relay Center, messages are sent to and received from SAC units, other commands, and headquarters, United States Air Force. Here, too, they repeat in writing every important voice message sent out to SAC units by command post radio or telephone. Priority and operational telephone communications are handled through special leased lines reaching throughout the world. In the communication status center, skilled technicians monitor the command's communication circuits and keep them operating. Actual command and control of the SAC force takes place at the lower level, deep below ground. Here you have to pass a final security control point where you must be recognized by the guard or by someone inside who sees you on television. This office receives a constant flow of messages reflecting the status of SAC's widely dispersed forces. This information is fed into computers where analysts constantly evaluate SAC versus enemy strength as they relate to emergency war plans. Critical data from the computers can be displayed quickly on screens in the command post.
Displays are vital for briefing the commander and the battle staff on daily operations, exercises, or national emergencies. Also at the lower level, deep below ground, are an intelligence situation room. And another where operations plans of the Joint Strategic Target Planning Staff keep the strategic war plans integrated. Here are the facilities and personnel which the SAC Commander-in-Chief uses continuously to control or monitor SAC operations. The command post has high-speed communications with all SAC units and aircraft and with other Air Force commands and key personnel everywhere. At the far right are the duty controllers. One officer, always a major or lieutenant colonel, and two non-commissioned officers. They are widely experienced in all phases of SAC bomber, refueling, and missile activities, and in controlling day-to-day -day operations of the force. Each duty controller has landline, cable, and radio circuits to all SAC units. Through these circuits, the controllers receive and pass information about SAC flights, aircraft, and missile status, location of key personnel, suspected sabotage reports, and many other facts. They monitor airborne alert aircraft. They follow SAC reflex aircraft, bombers that move to forward bases for short stays of alert duty. And they execute surprise operational readiness inspection tests that SAC inspectors spring on units to measure just how ready they are for combat. This system is manned by the senior controller, a full colonel who is authorized to act under the direction of the SAC commander in the control and execution of the SAC force. He controls several panels. One has the gold phone. Through it, the senior controller and the duty officer at the National Military Command Center in Washington have a direct link with one another. Through this network, all major military commands in the world and the highest level key government personnel can communicate immediately. The President and the Joint Chiefs might seek information from SAC over this network. White House orders to prepare for or go to war would be relayed through this phone. With this red phone and its panel, the senior controller can put the commander in immediate individual or conference contact with subordinate commanders, with the North American Air Defense Command in Colorado Springs, and headquarters United States Air Force in Washington. Wherever he goes, the SAC commander is always within reach of the gold or red telephones or their radio telephone extension. The controller can talk to any SAC unit individually by using this gray instrument. For example, whenever a SAC aircraft has an emergency, the controller acts as a single point of contact for assistance. These materiel controllers are always ready to provide specialized guidance. If necessary, they can also call upon design engineers who built the equipment for additional detail. The command post relies on two communications experts for good circuits. By dialing, they can seize high-powered SAC radio stations, select broadcast frequencies, and position antennas to give the controllers contact with air crews flying anywhere in the world. In an emergency, the SAC force would be alerted by the primary alerting system. Let's watch an actual demonstration. The primary alerting system is operated from this position. Merely by pushing the alert button, a warble tone sounds at each SAC unit's command post. Each unit controller copies the message. If it pertains to his alert force, he activates a klaxon, which alerts all personnel into rapid and efficient motion. The air crews race to their aircraft. Missile men in underground launch control centers hear the message direct from here and take appropriate action. Messages go over the primary alerting system through one of these special red phones. Operational directions for primary alerting system transmission, except for a routine maintenance message, which I will give in a moment, 
must be prepared in conjunction with the duty controllers and read by the officer duty controller in the presence of the senior controller. All stations acknowledge receipt on count. When they push acknowledge buttons on their consoles, the lights at the top go out. Every three seconds, automatic pulses go out on all primary alerting system circuits. If circuits are interrupted for any reason, lights below come on, which identify troublesome lines. Immediate steps are taken to restore these circuits. Now here's how the alerting system works. First, I must tell the duty controller that I'm going to send this message, and I must have one of the controllers with me. Failure to do either would result in the controllers forcibly stopping the message transmission. Major, I'm going to transmit a routine maintenance message. Will you join me at the console? Skybird, this is Dropkick with a maintenance test of all stations. There will not be an authentication with this maintenance test. All stations acknowledge at the count of five. One, two, three, four, five. This is Dropkick releasing the primary alerting system. When the lights go out, we know that those command posts received the message, understood it, and have taken the necessary prescribed action. If a light stays on, we can call that unit over the gray phone to make certain that the message was received and understood. Finally, every operational message which goes over the primary alerting system is also transmitted to all units by teletype. Behind the controller's positions are television monitors, one for current local weather information, the other for identifying visitors to the bottom floor as they reach the control point outside. This unit displays warning information supplied by North American Air Defense Command's Ballistic Missile Early Warning System, BMUSE. Powerful radar at three sites in Alaska, Greenland, and England can detect missiles fired from the other side of the world. It identifies missile threats to the North American continent, the number of missiles involved, time until the first one may hit, and predicted target areas. On the map, ellipses would indicate the general geographic areas of the predicted impact. This unit also displays all unidentified air-breathing threats that is, aircraft or missiles which operate in the atmosphere and are near our continent. They appear as orange tracks, like these planes flying around Cuba. This display is wired to special sensing devices in all probable target areas in the United States. It indicates the location of nuclear detonation. Identical warning systems are located on the command balcony. The SAC commander and his senior battle staff assemble here for briefings and would occupy these positions during exercises or actual emergencies in order to direct the SAC forces. All communications facilities of the command post extend to these desks. The commander has the gold and red phones here. Only the president can order the expenditure of nuclear weapons against an enemy. His orders would come over the gold phone. The red one is the SAC commander's network. The microphones feed into the command post's internal public address system to the floor below. Suppose that B. Muse warned us that we were about to be attacked. The senior controller would immediately relay this information to the SAC commander who would order our bombers into the air under what is called positive control. The duty controllers would pass the orders through the primary alerting system to all SAC units.
Within minutes, alert bombers and tanker crews would be airborne, safe from possible destruction on the ground, and headed for their targets. Tankers would rise from bases to rendezvous at refueling locations. All the bombers would fly toward predetermined positive control points located well outside enemy radar coverage. Regardless of the hour of the day or night, the SAC commander through the command post would be in touch immediately with the senior controller, the National Command Authority in Washington, and the SAC tactical commanders in the field, and thereby be in complete command and control of his forces. If upon further examination, the warning proved to be false, the bombers would return home. Positive and authenticated voice instructions originating at the presidential level are required to commit the SAC forces to their targets. However, if the attack were real, we'd soon know it. Even under the most severe attack, our big missiles would ride out all but direct hits. The President's order to strike back would pass down through the Joint Chiefs of Staff and their command post in the Pentagon, through the Commander-in-Chief of SAC and his command post's primary alerting system to all SAC units. The orders would be transmitted to the airborne force through many radio channels from widely dispersed sites. On the bombers and at missile sites, Crewmen, using instructions entrusted to each man separately, would compare their secret information and verify that the orders were valid. They would then have to act together to launch their missiles and two missile combat crew officers in another launch control center would also have to take the same action before any missiles could be launched. Bomber crewmen would act together to arm and drop their bomb. These procedures all combine to assure our positive control of nuclear weapons. If the SAC command post were put out of business at any time, its communications functions would pass to the command post of a SAC unit designated by a plan of succession. And the authority of SAC's commander would pass to a designated successor. This plan assures continuity of command and control of SAC's forces. There is an airborne command post, complete with the necessary communications equipment to take over should ground-based facilities be lost. It, too, is manned by experienced duty controllers. All of them rotate ships between the ground and air command posts at Offutt Air Force Base, Nebraska. A general is always in command. If he were to become commander-in-chief of SAC under the continuity plan, he would control SAC forces and execute emergency war orders at the president's direction. Special jet aircraft from Offutt Air Force Base have rotated to keep one command post airborne continuously over the United States since February 1961. The underground command post near Omaha, Nebraska is always fully manned, alert, ever busy, the pulsing heart of the Strategic Air Command. Through its system of command posts, SAC maintains command and control of the most powerful military force in the world. The SAC force is combat ready, much of it poised for immediate launching, and part of it airborne all the time. Because of this command and control system with its communications facilities, the SAC force can be positively controlled to help us, to deter potential attackers, to prevail if we have to fight, and to be confident that World War III can't be triggered by unauthorized launching of a nuclear bomb.